back, everybody. This is Paidea Today. I am Dr. Bill Friesen, and I'm joined here today by my colleague, Dr. Scott Masson. How are you doing, Scott? Hi. And uh, today we are talking about the Aeneid, Virgil's Aeneid, which is arguably one of the most influential, if not the most influential text aside from the Bible in Western culture. Yeah, you're going to start us off with a reading, I believe, from the introduction to the Aeneid. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll read the proem, the first uh, 14 lines of it. Arms and a man I sing, an exile driven on by fate. He was the first to flee the coast of Troy, destined to, to reach Lavinian shores and Italian soil. Yet many blows he took on land and sea from the gods above, thanks to cruel Juno's relentless rage, and many losses he bore in battle too, before he could found a city, bring his gods to Latium, source of the Latin race, the Alban lords, and the high walls of Rome. Tell me, Muse, how it all began. Why was Juno outraged? What could wound the queen of the gods with, with all her power? Why did she force a man, so famous for his devotion, to brave such rounds of hardship, bear such trials? Can such rage inflame the immortal's hearts? Uh, these are famous lines, uh, particularly the first line. Uh, whenever I teach this text, uh, to my first years, Bill, I point out that the very first line contains a, an implicit reference to the two epics of Homer, Arms and a Man, the Arms, a reference to the uh, Iliad, and the Man, a reference to uh, the Odyssey. And uh, in many ways, the Aeneid needs to be seen as uh, a secondary epic uh, giving homage to uh, Homer's great epics and in no way um, can be seen as a superior because it's, it's basically devoted and dependent upon the conventions established by Homer. And uh, certainly Homer uh, is regarded by all of the Latin poets as the great master of, of writing in the same way that he was by the Greeks. Uh, on the other hand, there are ways in which uh, and this becomes a new convention, I think, to some degree. Uh, there are ways in which Virgil is asserting that his epic is superior to Homer's. Not because of the style, although the style is equally splendid. It becomes the model for Latin writing for uh, millennia. But more because of the subject matter. Whereas Homer spoke of Achilles and his greatness, swift-footed Achilles and his glory, or of Odysseus and his uh, long-suffering and his and the wisdom. Constant, yeah, the man of constant sorrow. Yeah, the Polymetus, the many-minded Odysseus. These are speaking about individuals and their greatness, whereas his epic is speaking of the founding of, a, of an empire, and an empire uh, which is bringing in a golden age. And it's celebrating a place and a time which uh, has, a, has a civic dimension and a cosmological dimension, which we certainly don't see in the Greek epic. It's just not there. So it's the superiority of the subject matter, which I think Virgil is announcing in his epic and which has led many to regard it, even though it's a secondary epic, to have superiority to Homer's epic. Yeah, I think it, it's a text that is intrinsically public-minded. You're, you're fascinated by individuals in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That would be something a little bit foreign to the Roman imagination. I think it's absolutely key that you have read your Homer when you come to the Aeneid. I think a lot of readers come to the Aeneid without having deeply read their Homer. They might know about him, they might know about the Iliad, they might know about the Odyssey, but they haven't read those texts in great depth. And to some extent, this is part of a conversation piece here. This is the great, great conversation. And Virgil is responding back, sometimes in laudatory form, sometimes in ways which imply a degree of criticism on the Greek worldview. So you have to, in my view, you have to have read your Homer uh, before you read your, your, your Aeneid. There's a few other things that, that you mentioned uh, uh, along the way there that might be important. As you say, the first, uh, the first half of the Aeneid uh, speaks back to the Odyssey, the wanderings and what have you, and the thematic concerns that are bound up in that. 
Uh, and then the, the the second half, the other six books uh, are bound up very much with the concerns of the Iliad and, and warfare and conquest and all uh, those things. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, it's also important to remember that Virgil wrote 12 books specifically out of humility um, to uh, the divisions of the Homeric uh, epics uh, that we encounter. And the Romans were so taken with the work of Homer that it is said that they gave up entirely on the pretensions of a traditional Roman epic and just began teaching Homeric texts uh, in their own circles. And there's a final point I'd like to make here, a technical one. Uh, with the Homeric texts, at least theoretically, these are primary uh, epics. So they're, they're, uh, they're oral epics. They're uh, composed orally. Uh, they persist orally. They, they are things that are in the mind. They're things that are in the brain. They're not written down. They're not written down necessarily by one man. They're the product of an entire culture, but they focus. Although they're publicly on performed, it. right? Correct. Correct. Uh, so they're meant as performance pieces, which are produced by generations of continual uh, adjustment, uh, which is one of the reasons that uh, they're so incredibly refined, they're, they're so incredibly eloquent, uh, because people have been tweaking them and improving them for centuries. Mm. And everybody agrees that these are the central motifs, these are the central themes, uh, these are the, the tropes and schemes we're going to be using, this is how we adjust and, and uh, align various aspects of the text uh, beautifully against one another. And, uh, whereas with Virgil, we can now have an epic which is written down, and it's written down by one man. This is yeah. the product of one imagination, which adds a tremendous amount of unity to the vision, to be sure. Uh, but on the other hand, is this necessarily a cultural epic uh, in the way that the Homeric texts are? I'm not sure that it necessarily is. I think even Virgil expresses points of doubt and occasionally even dismay with the division that's being put forward there. He problematizes his own text, which I think is one of the great strengths of Virgil. We'll talk about that when we come to talk about book six in particular in yeah. our third installment. Yeah. And there are certain things that are being celebrated here. The, uh, there's a vision, which is a very Roman vision. Do you want to say a little bit about that? <laughs> well, the Roman vision, I would say, as it's foregrounded right here, it speaks of the, the outrage of Juno and her relentless rage right in the very few lines and what could possibly wound the queen of heaven. But she is outraged. She's outraged at the prospect that Rome will be founded on Lavinian shores, and she's outraged at that possibility. She's also outraged by what she knows will come, which is that her favored people, the Carthaginians, uh, are going to be thereby thwarted and put down. So it's, it's, she's outraged at what historically has yet to transpire, at least from the perspective of the narrator, obviously from the perspective of, of Virgil himself, the battle between the Romans and the Carthaginians is ancient history. Mm -hmm. But from the narrative perspective, it's not yet happened. It's it's you know she's she's seeing as it were into the future and 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 listening to prophecy as it were, and knowing that if the if if Aeneas goes on to found Rome as he's as he's fated to do, it will of necessity mean that the Carthaginians will not be the great empire that which she wishes them to be because they're mm -hmm. her. Her, her favored people. And so she's outraged. So there's an element of, uh, and this becomes a theme in the Aeneid, a conflict between passion, the furor is the word in, in Latin, and uh, piety, and, and fate furthermore. So fate is opposed to passion. Uh, and there's this conflict, this consistent conflict between uh, what is fated and what people wish which is against what's fated. And, and that sort of battleground happens within the gods themselves. It happens within uh, Aeneas himself, who for a, a time dallies in Carthage uh, because of being overwhelmed by his passion for Dido. Um, it happens um, uh, militarily. There's, there's conflict, as you said, book seven to 12. So there's, there's passions uh, flowing up there. And uh, that needs to be put down, but that's right at the outset there, that the passions and the passions and the furor of the gods and of the human beings is threatening to overwhelm even what is fated. And it will be for the hero, that is, in this case, uh, Aeneas, to subdue his own passions and do what is good for the glory of Rome. Not for his own self-interest, but out of the civic-minded uh, 
pious Aeneas who will do what needs to be done, he will do his duty. And that becomes the great Roman virtue, doing one's duty. Yeah, I mean, at the point when Virgil is writing here, they had been through, we think of the Romans very much as a, a culture grounded in war, and they were, to be sure. No doubt. Uh, they grew up through continual conflict, and it has been argued quite convincingly that Roman culture simply couldn't function without warfare. It, it needed it as a central dynamic. But that blinds uh, some readers to the fact that warfare also had, at the point when Virgil was writing, deeply traumatized the Roman wor uh, worldview. And one of the things that caused such tremendous trauma were the three Punic Wars with Carthage. You know, the, the Romans could not fathom the fact that they were not just being beaten, but they were being continually beaten. Trounced. <laughs> yeah, especially in the Second Punic War under Hannibal. Hannibal just handed it to him again and again and again. It was just brilliant, brilliant generalship. Including and, coming over the, the Pennines, or the, the, uh, not the Pennines, the Alps with his uh, elephants. Yeah, he had 33 elephants with him, um, <laughs> which were great in, in terms of actually awing your enemy, but actually in terms of battlefield value, they were a uh, suspect worth because yeah. um, you can panic them quite easily. Anyway, uh, the, the Romans, uh, remember, they were besieged by Hannibal. And, you know, Hannibal would ride around the walls of Rome on his horse. Uh, and the Romans just stood there and just watched them in dismay. It's like, what is happening? So we've got that. And the Romans eventually won out by just sheer bloody, tough-minded self-discipline. They just didn't give up. There's a famous anecdote whereby uh, Hannibal has besieged Rome and there's a plot of land right where the, the Carthaginians are sitting. Uh, as they besiege and uh, one Roman looks at another while they're standing on the walls and said, I'll sell you that bit of land right there. And the other guy says, yeah, absolutely. So they're showing tremendous confidence that ultimately they will win. But that doesn't mean that they're not massively traumatized by the Punic Wars. In addition to that, and even more traumatizing, of course, we've got the great civil war that racked the Roman Empire uh, and ended with the Battle of Actium. Yeah, that's that's more immediate because that's it's also personal because this the Battle of Actium is fought between the triumvirate, right, they, who arose right. when Julius Caesar was slain in 44 Correct. BC. And uh, we have to, I mean, it, it doesn't come up and Virgil doesn't make much of a deal of it, not uh, in the Aeneid nor indeed in the Eclogues or any place else. But he had been raised by uh, himself, a very pious father who had gone way out of his way to make sure that uh, Virgil had gotten a good education. Uh, he, he sacrificed considerably uh, to make this happen. We know that essentially Virgil's entire family was wiped out in that civil war, uh, as were so many families. Civil wars are one of the nasty things about them is that uh, they prey on civilians and culture and what have you as well. And with almost any culture, the most traumatizing war it can go through is a civil war. Yeah, we can uh, see that in, our, in the American brethren to the South. Uh, yeah, nothing, they still nothing are traumatized, traumatized by it. Nothing traumatizes the American imagination like that civil war. Or you could say the same thing again with uh, the English Civil War. Absolutely. Which per capita uh, was far bloodier for the English than any war before or after, including World, war, World Wars One and Two. The, the per capita death count was way higher and much more civilian-based. Uh, during the English Civil War. And uh, the, the same is true, sadly, for the Romans. And the Romans came out of the far end of that Civil War, like the English did, heavily traumatized and looking for peace, looking desperately for peace and what peace meant at a deep, eloquent, rich level, and sacrificing a lot to get that peace, the Pax Romana. The Pax Romana is a, a multi-faceted term. Uh, in one sense, it is a sinister term, because one way or the other, the Romans will make peace. And if that's through enormous violence and bloodshed. And it's by the sword. Let's be frank. By the sword. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't come around by, you know, sharing nice little sweet sentiments and what have you and everybody moderating and getting along. It, it comes with a spear and a sword and there is going to be peace one way or the other. Uh, but there's the positive side that you, you talked about the, the great golden age, which Virgil is celebrating in which uh, Caesar Augustus is going to usher in. Later on, after the English Civil War, of course, they uh, called their own period uh, in the wake of that the Augustan Age. Why did they do that? They do that with a direct reference right back to Virgil. Uh, this is indeed the Augustan Age. This is the Golden Age. Or in various places in the Aeneid, you can ask yourself, is it? Is it really? Yeah. Because uh, Virgil seems skeptical. 
He does, but on the other hand, he makes clear reference to it, and it's unambiguous, and it's a it's a theme of his writing. Furthermore, um, but there's a passage in the Aeneid Book Six uh, where he where Augustus is presented by his father, Book Six, by the way, which we'll talk about in greater detail in the third installment of this uh, podcast on the Aeneid. When Virgil, or rather, when Aeneas is in the underworld and meets his father the dead Anchises, and Anchises gives him a vision of the future, and he go, it goes through all of Roman history, and then towards the end of that reaches this one man, and it, it happens to be Augustus Caesar, um, and he says this of him, uh, lines uh, 1062 and following, by the way, this is the man, this one, of whom so often you have heard the promise, Caesar Augustus, son of the deified, who shall bring once again an age of gold to Latium, to the land where Saturn reigned in early times. Mm -hmm. So a reference to the golden age there uh, in the Aeneid. But as I said, this is a theme of his work in general. And I, I'm going to read an extract from Virgil's eclogue here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, in which he speaks of this golden age. Now, the, the eclogues, let me give a little back ground to that as well. The eclogues are, and his Georgics are earlier poetry, which really gave him his reputation as the great poet of his age. Uh, and they're largely agrarian and they're devoted to the beauties and the joys of rural life. But they do so in ways in which anybody who's ever lived on the countryside would not recognize as, no. this, is not, this is not realism in no, fiction. This is, this is idealized. It's an idealized vision of rural life. And I think we need to remember that much more so than the Greeks, the Romans were very attached to an idealized rural life. Uh, it was the Greeks who got the notion of the pastoral going yes, under yes. Theocritus in the third century. And uh, he made it fashionable, this notion. Uh, but the original readers of pastoral poetry, whether it's the eclogues or whether it's something else, would have known immediately, this is not real rural life this is something different but the romans they they were very much an agrarian people they were farmer soldiers from the earliest times uh, they built their culture up dynamically around the farmer culture model and uh, you had your plot of land you were deeply attached to your plot of land and your family that lived on it and then at a certain time of the year it was war season and you would pick up your shield and you would go with the, the rest of your romans and you would go to war and they did it for centuries because and they don't have a standing army, right? They, no, they do not. It's a citizen army in that sense. And you have to be trained. You have to maintain your training. You have to maintain your weaponry and all this stuff. And it was part of being a Roman citizen. That's yeah. one of the marks. Yeah. And the same thing with the Greeks, right? They had the same thing. Uh, yes. Citizens of the polis would have to do their duty by going to war when it was, when it was called upon. So I'm going to read from Virgil's eclogue, uh, his fourth eclogue. And then I make a comment on it because this... Uh, this fourth eclogue was of monumental importance in the reception of Virgil by the coming Christian world. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me read it first of all, and you'll, you'll hear the references to the Golden Age. But I think I also want you to listen for the references to a, a child who will be a king and the king who will put down not only violence, but to some degree seems to banish illness and death and war from the world and and just to tip uh, my hand on this, people in in Christian time saw it as a as an implicit reference to Christ. So let me read the passage here. Now the last age, by Cumae's Sibyl sung, has come and gone, and the majestic roll of circling centuries begins anew. Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Only do thou, at the boy's birth in whom the iron shall cease, the golden race arise. Befriend him, chaste Lucina, tis thine own Apollo reigns. And in thy consulate, this glorious age, O Pollio, shall begin, and the months enter on their mighty march. Under thy guidance, whatso tracks remain of our old wickedness, once done away, shall free the earth from never ceasing fear. He shall receive the life of gods and see heroes with gods commingling and himself be seen of them and with his father's worth reign or a world at peace. 
For thee, O oh boy, first shall the earth, untilled, pour freely forth her childish gifts, the gadding ivy spray with foxglove and Egyptian bean flower mixed, and laughing, laughing eyed acanthus. Of themselves, untended, will the she goats then bring home their udders swollen with milk, while flocks afield shall of the monstrous lion have no fear. Thy very cradle shall pour forth for thee caressing flowers. The serpent too shall die. Die shall the treacherous poison plant, and far and wide Assyrian spices bring. Spring, rather. But soon as thou, shalt, thou hast skill to read of heroes' fame and of thy father's deeds, and inly learn what virtue is, the plain by so, slow degrees with waving corn crops shall to golden grow, from the wild briar shall hang the blushing grape, and stubborn oaks sweat honey dew. Mm. Well, there's, there's a lot going on there. First of all, it's extraordinarily well translated. I'm gratified by that. Yes, it really is. I think there are a lot of bad translations of Virgil floating around out there. I, I wish I could tell you who the translator was. I mm -hmm. copied it many years ago and I use it. I distribute it whenever I teach the course. I, I must look it up because I should give the translator his due. And you can also sense in that with the sheer imagery of, of things natural, the plants and what have you, the, the Roman love of those sorts of details. They, they, they love their natural imagery and what have you. And this comes back to a universal motif that both Roman and Greek, but especially Roman writers uh, are very fond of, which is uh, this idealized, perfect sort of verbal portrait of a landscape, the idealized landscape. And this crops up again and again in Roman literature, whether you're reading Virgil or Horace or Ovid or Cicero or whoever it might be, Seneca does it as well. And will be uh, picked up in the English Renaissance and elsewhere. And again, uh, in uh, you know bucolic literature, we'll find it in the 17th century. And again, in the Romantic Age, there's this idealized view of nature. But uh, yeah. there are differences there. But we'll we'll come to those when we come to the Romantics, rather than waste time here. Yeah, it's uh, so you've you've got that natural imagery, that that love of the rural, the love of the not the and the idealization. Yes, the idealization, the open, explicit idealization. They know this isn't the real thing. I mean, these, these people live closer to the land than, than you or I. So they know what reality is like on the ground. So they know immediately when they hear this, that this is an idealized form. And this, uh, there's one other thing I'd like to say immediately in response to that, which is that when we were encountering the Greeks, whether that be in uh, their epics or in their drama, we encountered a worldview that was... Uh, existentially and historically uh, within this deterministic worldview, extremely pessimistic, extremely pessimistic. The Romans have, on the other hand, a kind of a hard-nosed optimism, if not an optimism for the individual who would have to sacrifice and suffer, nevertheless an optimism for the people overall, the Roman people. The Roman people are destined for victory and good things. And here in this case, here, a golden age. Not uh, destined, fated. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and the reference here to the golden age, because the, the reference to the golden age is not a new one. It, it, it is there in the Greeks, but it's there in the distant past and we can no longer attain it. We now live in the iron age. So they're, they're, the age is uh, mentioned by Hesiod, the idea that there's a golden yeah. age, which is succeeded by the iron or the silver age and then an iron age and then or a bronze age rather than then finally an iron age. We now live in the Iron Age, and in other words, it's a bleak, pessimistic view of life, and there will be no return to a golden age. Whereas in Roman thinking, there is a, a cyclical, and I think it, I'm not sure if it's introduced by Virgil. Do you know the, whether he introduces this idea? But it becomes one that thereafter, a certain cyclical view of history in which the golden age has returned. Yeah, I don't think uh, that's original to Virgil. I think Virgil's... Um playing off of a lot of inheritances. Some of these are Epicurean, some of these are Stoic, some of them involve more general thinking about the Logos and the nature of the Logos and how that's bound up with history. And we'll talk about that in later episodes. Well. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, one of the things I think that's also key to note at this point here is that more than anybody uh, prominent in Western literary history, the Romans were the great assimilators. And I, I can't underscore that enough. They had no interest in inventing ex nihilo uh, great works of aesthetic merit. Uh, 
uh, whether it uh, were law codes or uh, maybe it's literary traditions or maybe it's uh, aspects of religion or what have you, wherever the Romans went, whatever the Romans saw, they quickly snatched it up and adapted it to Roman purposes. Yep. And Virgil is an absolute uh, paragon uh, of how to do this. Uh, he snatched up Greek traditions uh, wherever he found them, but he snatched up all sorts of other traditions as well. And he adapted and he adapted and he adapted. The, the, the Romans never were exclusive in the way that oftentimes the Greeks were when it came to their aesthetic productions. And I think this is another thing that's absolutely key to, to remember about them. Uh, but let's come back to this notion here of destiny and fate. Before I do that, just uh, two comments. <clears throat> Firstly, and this is just looking forward a bit, this is why in the Enlightenment period, the model of excellence is that of the Greeks and not the Romans because the Greeks were original and the Romans were imitators, at least in the minds of, um, certainly in the Enlightenment. They saw the Greeks as great models of originality and the Romans as simply copiers and and assimilators and the enlightenment wanted to start over from a tabula rasa from ground zero and so they looked to the greeks and not to the romans so that's the first point the second is more of a historical commentary on the significance of virgil himself and this particular text and why it became so significant because you mentioned how influential it was this is the great text uh, uh, you said at the outset Alongside the Bible, this is the greatest literary text of the Western world yes. in terms of influence, certainly. And the first reason is because it was a, it was a source of grammar and of, of rhetoric. It was a manual for style. Virgil's Latin was so superb that everyone who learned Latin wrote in Latin, which because of the Roman Empire, all civilized people did for mm -hmm. millennia, would look to Virgil. Uh, the second point was because of the prophecy of Christ, which they saw in Virgil's fourth eclogue. They saw, the, the church saw this text and Virgil himself and his writing as in some ways uh, having greater theological weight than other pagan texts did. So the reference to this, this, this child who would uh, receive the life of gods and, um, and a reference to an age when a monstrous lion will uh, give no fear to the, to the, the cows and the, and the flocks and, uh, and the serpent will die. All of these were almost references, another version of what we might read from the book of Isaiah, which we read at Christmas time, you know, th those sorts of messianic texts. And, and certainly Augustine thought this, and we'll read this text later on, Dante explicitly referred to Virgil as a man who had prophesied of the Messiah, but he didn't even know it. The Roman poet Statius is the one who speaks of this. He said that he came to faith through Virgil's work. He, and Virgil was like a man who had a lamp behind his back. Uh, he didn't see the light himself, but, the, but what he wrote allowed others to see the light. Yeah. It's, you know, it's perhaps appropriate to mention again that the, the, the late antique period and straight throughout the Middle Ages, nobody had Homer as a model for excellence, whether in Greek or in any other form. What they did have was Virgil and his Aeneid. And so it's, like I said before, it's difficult to underscore sufficiently just how influential this text was in terms of motif, in terms of theme, in terms of writing style, in terms of any number of things. Um, I've told students before that if you're going to read one text, one great text from Western civilization, probably it should be uh, Virgil's Aeneid. But as I said at the beginning of this broadcast, you really don't get anywhere near uh, what you ought to get out of it unless you've read your Homer first and see what he's responding to. Uh, let me touch also briefly on that other thing that you mentioned in terms of uh, the way that we inherited uh, and assimilated Virgil's work. Uh, Augustine was probably the most influential writer on this front where he said, you know, we need not to reject the great excellent works of uh, pagan culture, whether they're Greek or Roman, uh, insofar as they're excellent, uh, insofar as they're beautiful, insofar as they're true, insofar as they're all these things, they, they line up with God's essential characteristics, uh, the transcendentals, we call them. <laughs> um, so if it's beautiful, it's of God. If it's true, it's of God. If it's just, it's of God. And there is much beauty, truth, and goodness in Virgil's Aeneid or other works for that matter. 
And so Christians need to take them on. Christians yeah. need to convert them to Christian purposes. Uh, and this becomes a standard way of doing Christian cultural business. Uh, over the next number of centuries, there are pagan holidays, for instance, in Anglo-Saxon England, uh, which the, uh, the missionaries simply converted to Christian purposes. Eostra becomes Easter and Yule becomes Christmas and what have you. And this is an explicit part of how they do business. They, they've literally got handbooks on how to do this. But to a huge extent, it starts with Christians adapting excellent Roman works of literature to their own purposes. Aug uh, Augustine is at the forefront of this, and the Aeneid is at the forefront of this. In uh, his little work which I deal with in my history of literary theory, De Doctrina Christiana on Christian Doctrine, in, in the second book of the four, he talks about, and it becomes a famous passage, about uh, how God commanded the Israelites to plunder the Egyptians. Yes. And, and, and literally to take, and, the, and furthermore, he commanded the Egyptians to give them their, their goods. And Augustine uses that modeling of plundering what is good uh, as the model for cultural engagement as well. What they do is they take the gold that the Egyptians had, and from that, they fashion the, the work of the temple. Like they, they fashion it with gold. It's inlaid with gold. Everything's with gold. What I point out to my students, but Augustine doesn't mention it there, is that those goods that God has designed or deigned for his, his purposes can be used for his purposes, or they can do what their own desires wish them to do and lead them to do, which is the first thing they, they do, which is to build a, a golden calf. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 there, there's nothing intrinsic in the gold which is good per se, it's the use for which it is utilized. It can be made into a golden, another golden calf, so it's an abuse of the gold, or it can be used for sacred purposes. But that, that model of appropriation and use for proper purposes is one in which uh, Christianity and culture are well described, I think. It's a, it's a good model. This is a concept, actually, which, again, I think the Christians inherited and it adapted to their own purposes. They're this notion that it takes a righteous mind to use such plunder responsibly. And this ties into pedagogical practices, teaching practices uh, that uh, Christians inherited from the Greeks and Romans. You had to train the character first. Yes. Then you gave the character a toolbox of concepts, of notions, of paradigms, and what have you. Uh, the learning that uh, we talk about today. Nowadays, of course, education doesn't do this. Education simply equips the mind, that is to say the toolbox. And what guides the use of those tools is left up to chaos and anarchy. Or, or yeah. what, But the, the character or nature of the individual is not trained. It's not cultivated. It's not civilized. Uh, whereas with the Greeks and Romans, they were very keen on this notion. First, you educate the character, then you educate the mind. Actually, every culture up until our current benighted age did that they regarded character training as preeminent yeah training in wisdom and virtue that is what education is exactly it's uh, as the philosopher roger scruton says it, it trains you first uh, what to feel towards what objects in what way to what degree and at what time uh, and that's that's an emotional training uh, not necessarily an intellectual training because otherwise you, you equip the powerful mind or you make the the mind powerful and you could have a, a particularly benighted uh, individual now uh, very well equipped to do tremendous damage right you give a you give a demon great great tools with which to do great havoc bill to conclude this episode do we want to at least mention something about aeneas's pietas and virgil's conception of pietas and the significance of pietas and what what is let's start off with just the question what is pietas if Aeneas has a defining characteristic, I mean, all these heroes have a defining characteristic. So for Odysseus, it was his, his scheming ability, for lack of a better word. And with Achilles, it's his wrath. And with uh, Aeneas, it's his, his devotion, his pietas, uh, that really defines the man. And he struggles with this at numerous points in the text. But pietas is this notion of uh, self-sacrifice. It's it's uh, uh, your obligations to your community. It's an obligations to your family. Family is absolutely central in ways it isn't necessarily in Greek uh, literature. And it's not that you just have obligations or duties. It's that these duties to others are sacred. If you violate them, there's a sense in which you violate Roman taboos. It's not just ethical or moral. It's, it's a taboo violation again. And that's something that's absolutely key 
to understanding Roman culture more generally speaking. What Aeneas is destined to do is destined uh, at, this, at this holy level of his obligations. And when he violates them, the gods themselves intervene on these fronts. So when he dallies with Dido, that is a, a rejection of his obligations to his people and to his destiny. It's bound up in one, one thing, the people and the destiny. You, we see this also with uh, accidental neglect of the dead later on in book six and what have you. Uh, this comes up again. But the, the Roman father figure, the, the pater familius that we talk about so much nowadays, is absolutely driven by this one sort of compass. This is, this is the thing that should be orienting him. And we like to talk about the violations of pietas by Roman historical figures and whatnot, or even literary figures, uh, pointing out how it's all a fraud. We, we live in an age that is very much addicted to deconstruction and uh, revealing the hypocrisy and so on and so forth. But the bottom line is the Romans talked about this kind of violation of pietas precisely because it was so important to them. It really incensed them when they found a figure who violated pietas. And infamously, as I said in a few points in the Aeneid here, that's exactly what Aeneas does. He violates the, the obligations of piety. And he himself, the representation of piety, violates the very thing that he upholds. You got it. And uh, you mentioned how Christians assimilate uh, large numbers of uh, things from Roman culture and from the Aeneid specifically. And they, they take up this notion of piety, Christian piety, on the other hand, very much with many, many cues from exactly this text. So if you want to understand what early Christians are talking about when it comes to piety, it pays well to look at what's happening in this text here, this pagan text. So, so in early Christian, by which we're talking about the patristic era, right? We're not talking about... This right. is the late, yeah, the late antique period, let's say between about uh, 350 all the way out to about 650 or so. But there's a civic mindedness. Um, there's a devotion. Not, so it's not an individual piety. I think that we, we need to make uh, note of that because in the post-Reformation sense of piety, at least in Protestant circles, for sure, piety is often a private virtue. It's, yes. it's a sense of my own um, integrity before God, but it doesn't have any public outworking per se. It's about quiet time. It's about certain individual duties that are not seen by others. But that's not the sense of piety that's meant here. Piety invariably has a public outworking. And it has the, the good of everyone in mind and not just of himself. And in fact, it is Aeneas's very self-denial which marks him as the exemplum of Roman piety. He, he does not do what he desires to do, which is to stay in in Carthage with Dido because he, he, I think he genuinely does love her, but yeah. he's willing to turn his back on her uh, for the glory of Rome, for the sake of little uh, Eulus or Ascanius, his son and the glory of Rome, which he has faded to ground. He's willing to deny himself and put others first. And that becomes the, the model of Roman piety. Yeah, nothing could be farther from uh, an epic hero's mind like Achilles than this notion of self-sacrifice. Absolutely. Absolute madness. Uh, Aeneas doesn't come out happy in the end. He ends up, in, in the balance of things, he ends up uh, coming out at a loss uh, in many senses. He, is, uh, he lines up very well with Odysseus. He's a man of, of great sorrow and suffering. He undergoes much and gives up much. He's also, we got to remember the sense of the family here. I mean, it's not going to get played upon too much in the Aeneid, but nevertheless, it's, it's a concern here. You oftentimes hear that the Potter Familius had within his own household absolute rights, like literally over life and death. Um, so if he wanted to put his own family to death, he had every right to do so, and nobody could stop him. And you hear that oftentimes quoted. That's, this is something that's a talking point when it comes to the Potter Familius. But you also have to remember that he also has those sacred duties and obligations of self-sacrifice to that same family. And if he does these things, he would have to do so from that perspective if he's to do right by the Roman conception, by the Roman worldview. So it, it's very much a culture of self-sacrifice, which is a, a radical departure from Greek visions uh, of the world. And there's this really fascinating fusion when rome ultimately conquers greece they say that you know they were invited in to uh, promote uh, their usual uh, excuse for invasion was they're going to bring the light of civilization to these benighted people whoever they were whether they're gauls or iberians or, or whatnot 
Um, but they, they couldn't say that to the Greeks because the Greeks were more civilized than them. Um, so they had to find different pretexts by which they uh, would invade them and take them over and enslave them. And they did enslave them. But one of the things they did when they enslaved hundreds of thousands of Greeks was they, they enslaved extremely learned, cultured people. They employed they them as their teachers. And you got it. And you have this entire mass subclass uh, of Greek teachers coming in and teaching uh, Roman children, the Roman families. And so there's a saying that, you know, first the, the Romans conquered the Greeks and then the Greeks conquered the Romans. And it's true. There's this fascinating fusion of Greek worldviews, uh, an extremely complex level, with Roman worldviews. And you have this, this uh, curious fusion of this notion of piety and self-sacrifice fusing with this Greek sort of uh, a- ambition, the arete and, and stuff like this, which, uh, which produces such magnificent works. And Virgil lives on the cusp between those two worlds. And I, I was reminded in, while you were talking there that that Roman proverb, dulce et decorum pro patria more, it's oh, sweet. sweet and beautiful to die for one's country. That's uh, in conjunction with the pater familias, the father, that sense that it is beautiful to give your life for the sake of the, the patria, the fatherland so the father for the fatherland so the greater good than the father himself and that just you know it really does fit with what you were saying about pietas and the roman obligation that is laid upon fathers for all of the power that they're given over life over their uh, children and families they have at the same time uh, an equal sacred obligation to lay down their lives for their country correct it's you know it's the farmer father husband figure who's going off to risk his life on the battlefield for the for the well-being of the people of the patria uh, and also the familia the family um he, he is he's a very sacrificial figure in that sense and then the, and then this becomes christianized because of course jesus says that it is that this is how god displays his love he doesn't just die for his friends he will lay down his life for his enemies which no roman would ever conceive and no. and, ne- and never agree to because this is not worldly thinking this is of a different sort of kingdom and that again is a transformative thing but that's again getting ahead of ourselves a bit but uh, there, there there are certainly still commonalities between virgil's vision of piety and christian views of piety namely the civic mindedness and the devotion to the greater good and the devotion to goodness and beauty and truth as you said those things persist throughout yeah, as the Roman Empire is more and more threatened with collapse and fragmentation as, as the centuries go by, one of the lamentations you hear continuously in a myriad of different forms is that Roman leadership is increasingly living for itself, existing for itself, operating for its own self-interest. This was a scandal to the Roman imagination. This was d- yeah. disgusting uh, that people should be doing this, whether it's an emperor or whether it's the equites or whoever it might be. And maybe we should end on this notion here, which is that if you were in a position of leadership in Roman culture, you were expected to be a self-sacrificer. That was how it was expected to work. Uh, And we'll go into the the patron-client relationship in more detail in in following broadcasts. But here just suffice it to say that a position of leadership held in the Roman imagination, implicit within it, the notion that you would give. You You would give to the public and you would get nothing back from it. They were continually patronizing great works, whether they're aqueducts or coliseums or roadways or what have you. It it was the powerful leader figures in that immediate community who were providing that. They were providing that without any expectation of immediate compensation for it. It was just the way you operated. If if you were a leader, you you were a self-sacrificer. This is bound up with your pietas. And that's what garners you the venerable respect of the people around you who would then, of course, uh, gravitate towards you as your clients. Uh, and you would decide whether or not that talent was uh, adequate to, to, to actually patronize these individuals. And certainly we see with, uh, with Virgil, that's, that's what happened with him. You get this great figure of Mycenaeus who discerns the talent. Sorry, uh, who's Mycenaeus? Mycenaeus is, is a powerful, powerful uh, individual in Roman culture. He's well connected to uh, Augustus. And uh, he discerns the sheer raw talent of Virgil. And he decides to take him on as his client. And he introduces him to the right people. He uh, backs him monetarily. He ends up giving him ultimately a great villa and estate in the countryside. 
Uh, and this was just how Roman culture worked. Uh, right. So patronage. If you don't understand the patron client relationship, you don't understand the Roman empire as with pietas. And this becomes hugely influential later on to Christian culture as well. And it's, it's all bound up with a sort of a unified dynamically consistent way of doing life for the Roman. And we're still waiting for those patrons ourselves. Are we not bill? We need yeah, to. That's right. That's right. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think this was a really interesting discussion. Uh, we're going to continue it uh, next time, but perhaps that would be a good way to end. We'll, t- we'll come back to talking about Dido, and then thereafter we'll talk about uh, the enormously influential book six. I mentioned yes. how the Aeneid is hugely influential, and if there's one book in the Aeneid that is more influential than any of the others, then by far it is book six, Journey to the Underworld, where he's speaking back. Uh, of course, to Homer, and then, of course, uh, a lot of other writers, most significantly, perhaps, amongst them, Dante, uh, speaks to book six. So, absolutely core. Brilliant. So, this has been uh, Paideia today, and uh, our discussion here has ended, and uh, we'll see you next time. I am Dr. Scott Masson, and this is my colleague, Bill Friesen. See you next time. <laughs>